Hello, my name's Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of the book you see in front of you, Modifying the Aerodynamics of Your Road Car. What I want to do in today's video is talk about how you can make a good quality and effective belly pan or under tray. And I call it an under tray in my book, and that's what I'll do in today's video. A good under tray can reduce aerodynamic drag and it can reduce lift. So the first thing you need to keep in mind is you must design it so it is stiff. Why? Because if it is working properly, you're actually going to have reasonable forces acting on that under tray. For example, at speed, you could have a force of up to 30 kilograms, that's 70 pounds, for each square meter pulling down on the under tray. Is it going to tear off? Is it going to deform? You obviously don't want either of those things to occur. So how do you achieve that? Well, firstly, you can use thin aluminium sheet and then stiffen it by pressing beads into it. Here's a bead that's been rolled into this one. And here, this is a full length under tray. You can see the bead markings again have stiffened the sheet. Now you need a bead roller to do that. Not many people have that at home, but a professional uh, sheet metal workshop could probably do it for you. An alternative is to simply use thicker aluminium sheet, which won't deform as much. It won't need the beads because it will have more stiffness on its own because of its thickness. Another way is to use a composite material, often used by people who make signs. And if you go to a sign making business, they'll be able to show you some of these different composite panels. This is three millimeter die bond. That's two sheets of 0.3 millimeter aluminium with a solid polyethylene core. You can still cut it, you can still work it, but it's a lot stiffer than, than many other materials. Or you can do what I do, this isn't one of my cars, but this is the approach I often take. Use two millimeter or three millimeter thick ABS sheet and then use lots of fasteners. Now ABS is the type of plastic, you can hit it with a hammer, it doesn't break and so rocks don't break it either if they impact your under tray, but you can cut it with a coarse blade on a woodworking saw, a sabre saw, a jigsaw, anything of that sort. Or if you wanna get really fancy, of course, you can use carbon fiber, very, very stiff and very, very light, but for a one-off, it's typically too much work. But don't forget, you can buy a flat carbon fiber sheet that's been pre-made, and that's reasonably cheap and still quite light. Or you can use marine plywood. People tend to turn their nose up at this, but marine plywood, not just normal plywood, well, that will fall apart when it gets wet, but marine plywood designed, as the name suggests, for use in marine applications. It uses a waterproof glue. You'll find it's quite stiff and it's relatively light and you can get whatever thickness you want. And again, just cut it to shape with normal woodworking tools. And of course, if it did ever scrape on the ground or get hit by rocks, it's quite resilient in, in resisting that sort of attack. Now, don't forget though, and here's where it becomes more complex than a lot of people first believe when they think about doing an under tray. If you are bridging large gaps, you may well need a structural steel reinforcement. And this is a steel frame that I've welded up for the rear under tray on one of my cars. And it's made of square tube welded together and it's needed to support the under tray in its correct shape. You don't want the under tray being deformed by aerodynamic forces. If you set it to a certain shape, that's the shape you want maintained, even with those 20 or 30 kilogram forces acting on it per square meter. Don't use core flute or coroplast unless you're just doing a mock-up test. There's nothing wrong with doing mock-up tests uh, where you can stiffen it with, with just bits of timber uh, on the underside or whatever. But really, as a permanent installation, this material doesn't have a lot going for it. It's pretty weak. It, it, it gets impacted and torn by rocks and things of that sort. Testing, yeah, sure. But as the final one, I'd steer clear of any material of this type. Second thing. You need to fasten that under tray into place securely. If the under tray comes off when you are cornering at speed, and if your under tray is developing proper downforce or a, a major reduction in lift, it could be quite dangerous. We're not talking about typical factory under trays, which are just there to, to protect the bottom of the engine. We're talking about proper aerodynamic under trays. And if they are working, then their sudden abrupt removal on the road will cause a, a major change in the way the car is behaving. So the attachments need to be engineered properly. 
Not just what's gonna hold it on while it's sitting in my driveway, but what's gonna hold it on when I'm actually driving at speed. And of course, it needs to be removable for maintenance. Not just the bit under the engine when you wanna do oil changes, but the bits under the rest of the car as well. And maybe suspension changes need to be made or a new fuel pipe needs to be run or whatever. So, you'll see that top line manufacturers actually fasten their under trays into place very securely. An Audi TT RS, here's the front standard under tray, 14 screws to hold it in place. There's the aluminium uh, under tray, which is just behind the front one, 10 screws to hold it in place, and I think they're M6, basically quarter inch screws. They're not doing that for fun, they're doing it because they want it to be secure, especially under aerodynamic forces. So how can you do it? Well, nuts and bolts. I notice that these bolts have got washers and spring washers, flat washers and spring washers, so they're much less likely to come apart. Riv nuts, this is what I use. So a riv nut is like a pop rivet, if you like. It's put into a hole, a special tool then flares the end, and the nut becomes captive in the hole, and you can then screw a bolt in it. Why are riv nuts so good for under trays? Because if you drill through the sheet metal of the bottom of the car floor, obviously making sure nothing's on the other side, you can then insert one of these riv nuts, flare the riv nut, and you've got a captive nut that you can screw one of these bolts into. It works really, really well. If you are using brackets, and you probably will need to use brackets, use proper quality brackets, not just some light sheet metal thing from a furniture company, but proper brackets which are actually going to work in that condition with those forces. Another proper bracket if you have to space something down slightly. Now remember, a bracket like that above the under tray will be in tension because the under tray is being pulled down on. Here's what not to use. Don't use cable ties to, to tie an aerodynamic attachment to your car. How scummy, what a scummy way of doing it. Don't use bits of wire and, and a pair of pliers to tie them in place. Bit of quality, a bit of pride in what you're doing. Don't use self-tapping screws, primarily because each time the under tray has to come off, the hole into which that screw is formed will deform a little bit more uh, and, and you know, it'll end up but not being effective at all. Contrast that with roof nuts, where you can screw in and out a hundred times and it will still work perfectly. And don't glue things into place. What happens when it does have to come off for maintenance? You just have to destroy the under tray. Really, really bad way of doing things. What about the design? Well, people go overboard, I think, a lot on this stuff. Really, there's only three fundamentals. You want it to be big. You want to cover as much of the floor area under the car as possible, being careful of the exhaust, which I'll come to in a minute. You want a smooth downwards curve under the engine, and I'm assuming here the engine's at the front of your car. That accelerates the air, you get a lower pressure, and so you get less lift or more downforce at that point. And at the rear, you want an upwards curve, which is effectively a diffuser. Do you need strakes in it? No, not necessarily. Is that angle critical? No, in most cars it's you know, 8, 10, 12 degrees, somewhere around there, and that's all fine. People who talk about a single dimension being critical haven't really looked at the research where there's a whole range of dimensions and angles that are used. And if you're roughly in that ballpark, it'll work fine. So here's a standard under tray from a Jaguar XF. Make it large. Look how large this one is. And incidentally, look how they're protecting parts of that plastic under tray from heat with this aluminium foil. But it extends up into the wheel wheels. It extends right back under the gearbox. It's got that curve under the engine, which I talked about a moment ago. Uh, I mean, obviously it's a professional factory under tray, but it gives you a few ideas. Here's a smooth downwards curve under the engine from a, several Volkswagens. Now, you might look at that and say, isn't that curve very steep? Remember, you're near the front of the car, the boundary layer is quite thin, and so the air can flow and attach itself around curves which are reasonably uh, sharp. Uh, they're not folded edges, of course, but they're reasonably sharp corners. And if you look at the front of the car and think of the airflow wrapping around onto the bonnet, onto the hood, it normally will stay attached there on the top surface uh, because the boundary layer is still thin and the same applies on the underside. As you get towards the rear of the car, those changes into shape, uh, changes in shape must be more gentle. Here's a rear diffuser. Um, most people will look at it and say, that's not a diffuser, it hasn't got strakes and it doesn't look all over the top, doesn't need to be. Just needs to be a flat panel that is angled up slightly towards the rear of the car. 
Don't cover the exhaust unless there's plenty of clearance. This is touching the exhaust. If you drive the car hard, and if you're climbing a long hill or anything of that sort, uh, exhausts get very, very hot. In fact, uh, it's not inconceivable that they're glowing red hot in parts. So you do not want to have under trays um, touching exhaust. You want to leave sufficient clearance around it. And again, if you look at factory standard cars, you'll see they always, unless it's a rear engine car, uh, front engine car, they always leave that exhaust uh, un, uncovered in order to, to, to give decent cooling. And don't make really sharp folded edges like this. This is at the front of the car, so the airflow will probably stay largely attached, but you don't, you don't, don't want to do it like this. If that was a gentle curve and that was a gentle curve, this would be much more, you would be much more confident that this would have attached airflow. It's all in the book, modifying the aerodynamics of your road car, a major part on designing and fitting belly pans under trays. I think they are amongst the very best aerodynamic modifications you can make. Thank you.